The psalmist saith this, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout with the voice of triumph. Now, I know most of you all are, are, are praying and hoping that football season comes around without any interruption, if you're like I am, amen? And, um, and I know if your Cowboys get a chance to go to the Super Bowl, some of y'all are going to be shouting with the voice of triumph. Am I right about it? You're going to be clapping. You're going to be dancing. You're going to be doing all kinds of stuff. If the Saints go back, I know we're going to have a party in Louisiana. Am I right about it? Yes. Hallelujah. But the psalmist said, oh, clap your hands, all you people shout with the voice of triumph. If you know you are victorious in Christ Jesus, if you know that you're the head, not the tail, you're above and not beneath, if you're an overcomer, not an underachiever, then you ought to clap your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Come on, say thank you. I thank God for all that he's done. Listen, it's, it's good to see you here in the house of worship today. Good to have all those who are join, joining us via live stream. It is uh, a beautiful day the Lord has made, and we come to rejoice and to be glad in it. Amen? So if you have your Bibles, guys, we're going to start off uh, again going back to our scripture in Genesis, the 21st chapter. And we're going to begin our reading uh, at verse number eight this morning. We've been dealing with the subject over the past 10 weeks, guys. 10 weeks we've been talking about me and my dysfunctional family. Everybody say me, me. and my dysfunctional family. Every family unit that's in the earth realm has some level of dysfunctionality. Can I get a witness? The Bible says we're all born in sin and shapen in iniquity. So we all got some messed up stuff. I told you when we start this series that word dysfunction means to not operate normally or properly. How many of y'all would care to admit and share with me that through the course of your family, I know you have good families, but there are times when family doesn't operate properly. Can I get a witness? If you've been married past two seconds, you'll know that sometimes it don't operate properly. Can I get one husband to say amen if you ain't scared? All right, all right. So, so, so dysfunction is, 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 is a part of this fallen world that we live in. It means to be troubled. It means to be distressed, unsettled, upset, uh, distraught, unbalanced, unstable, disordered. It means to be maladjusted, uh, neurotic, emotionally confused, unhinged, mixed up, and messed up. And there are times in our life, guys, if we're honest, we, we experience those things. And we've talked about family unit being more than just our biological family. But we talk about a family as a group of one or more persons and their children living together as a unit. It's also all the descendants of a common ancestor. So if you believe that the Bible is true, and I am the one who believes it, if you believe that God spoke, amen, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and inspired men to write the Holy Scripture and that it is inerrant, then you got to know that all of us are part of the same family because we have common ancestor. All of us came from Adam and Eve. So whether you're black, white, yellow, green, purple, we all come from one blood. So we are family. Look, look across, the, uh, out, across the auditorium and say, we are family. Yeah, we all are family. So if we are family, we're talking about me and my dysfunctional family. How many of y'all will admit and agree to me, to, with me today that this world of, of, of human beings are really mixed up and messed up? And, but but here's, here, here's the good news, guys. There is an answer for our dysfunctionality. God has the ability to transform a dysfunctional family. And that's what we're trying to do through this series, talking about me and my dysfunctional family. Now, when we look at, we looked at the family of Abraham, because that's the, that's the family that God chose to bring the Savior in the earth realm through. And we see that God dealt with Abraham and, and, and all of the things that he went through. And we saw the challenges. We saw the sin. And we saw him uh, mess up and get mixed up. But then we get to the point, almost to the point to where we talked about the other Sunday, where, where when Abraham believed God and it was accounted up for him for righteousness. In this 21st chapter, that long-awaited son that God had promised he and Sarah had, had came to pass and he had been birthed into the earth realm. And we begin to get into this text right here. But one thing, guys, we've got to realize is that Abraham is man just like you and I. But he's the father of the faith. All of the world major religions, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity trace their heritage back to the father Abraham. And so when we look at his life and we look at 
uh, his family unit and it's all of the dysfunction that went on. You know, Sarah told him, hey, listen, go sleep with my handmaid and have a son. But we're going to see that that caused some, some dysfunctionality in this family. We're going to see it here in this chapter. How many of you know blended families can be tough? Y'all you know what a blended family is, right? When you got, you know, divorces taking place or whatever, and you have a child that's not the biological child of the father or the mother, and then all of a sudden when, when people don't do it God's way, it doesn't work very well. But I've seen families who, who took it upon themselves to say, we're going to do the, even though this is not God's original design for divorce or whatever, and I got remarried, but we're going to do it God's way, and it's not going to be your child, it's going to be our child. And when they learn how to do it the right way, that family, even though that was not God's original plan, but God can use that family to bless other families in the earth realm. Can I get a witness? So we get here in, 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 in verse number eight of this 21st chapter. Let's begin our reading right quick. And as we're going down to that, guys, I want to I share something with you guys. You know, God is always testing us and, and, and refining us no matter how long we've been saved. God is always trying to purge any hint of dysfunctionality out of our lives. Are y'all with me? I, 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 uh, an interesting story I, I share, I may have shared it with a couple of you guys, but uh, it's, it's about uh, really uh, to a couple of days ago, it was a month ago. And I believe this was nothing more than a test than God was sending my way to try to see uh, where I stood. You know, how many of y'all got some damage during this recent hailstorm that took place here in, in North Bozier Parish in, uh, back April 24th, I believe it was. So my son's car and I, my, my truck and his truck was parked outside, so I had significant hail damage, a little over $10,000 worth of hail damage uh, on, my, on my vehicle. But an interesting thing happened. The, the body shop, you know when, you, when they do the estimate, we did it a virtual estimate. Uh, guy on the phone, I got my, uh, we FaceTime, and I'm walking around the vehicle showing him the hail damage. But they always tell you when you get uh, uh, into the accident and you have a claim, they tell you, well, if the body shop finds anything else, just let, tell them, let us know, and, 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 and then and we'll, we'll, we'll fix, get it fixed and we'll send the money directly to them. And most times, uh, unless it's something that's totally outrageous, uh, the insurance company, when, since I've been taking my vehicles to get them repaired, they don't really question the body shop. So the body shop called me, all right? The body shop called me and told me, Hey, uh, Mr. Abbey asked the question. Mr. Adam, was these, these, there's some scratches on your door right here. Was that a part of the hailstorm? Was that hail damage? Now, guys, guess what? That was there before the hailstorm came. Now, in my mind, the enemy sent a thought and said, you know, nobody's going to know. If you, t if you say that's part of the hailstorm, the insurance company is probably not going to question it because they rarely do on something like that. It was just going to be painting the door. And, and, and for a fleeting moment, Dick and Kenneth Douglas, for a fleeting moment, the thought came and said, say that's part of the hailstorm. But immediately the Holy Spirit checked me and said, you better not do that. This is a test coming your way, and God wants to see what kind of man of honor and integrity you are. Because see, nobody probably would have known, but God would have known. And that was the test. How many of you know all throughout our lives, guys, God is bringing tests our way to help purge all of the dysfunctionality out of our life? So your test may be different than that, but guess what? You're going to be tested. Because faith that cannot be tried, faith that cannot stand up under the test is not really true faith. Are y'all with me today? So let's, let's, let's read right quick. The text says this, and the child grew. Isaac had been born now, and the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. How many of y'all remember when you wean your baby off the bottle? Any of y'all remember that? How many of y'all let the baby stay on the bottle too long and his teeth got bucked because you, you wouldn't? <laughs> he was weaned and they had a celebration because he got to this point and it was customary during this time for them to, to throw a big feast. But look what the text says. Next verse says what? And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born under Abraham mocking. He was making fun of this boy. Some, some, some theologians say he was two, maybe three years old at this time when he was weaned off of his mother's breast, you know, uh, uh, her, her nurse breastfeeding him. And so, but 
the, the original root word here actually means not just he just made fun of them that one day, but if you study that root word, it actually means that there was a continual badgering and, and, and making fun and, and just coming after this little boy because you have to understand something. Uh, until Isaac came along, Abraham was pouring all of his love toward Ishmael. Even though he came by the outside woman, even though he was born, if you study biblical theology, you know that Ishmael in Hagar represents the flesh. Sarah and Isaac represent that which is of the spirit. Can I get a witness? So, so Abraham slept with Hagar, had Ishmael, and Abraham loved Ishmael. But if y'all know how it is when the new baby comes around, you got that five-year-old who, who looked at that baby real, you know, you have to have to watch that five-year-old because that five-year-old may go over there and, and throw something on top of that baby. Because that baby is now moved into their space. And so we see Ishmael, I can imagine him thinking, I had all of my father's attention, Lou, until this new boy came along. And now Abraham is pouring his love and, and direction toward Ishmael, I mean, toward Isaac. And now Ishmael becomes jealous. He begins to mock. He begins to make fun of little old Isaac. Now, one thing about that, guys, I want you to understand is that this, you know, you ever heard the term, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? How many of y'all heard that before? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and, and you're more like your parent than you care to admit. Can I get two witnesses up in here? And anybody that knows you well and know your parents well will say, you got, you, all of us got some of our parents in us, even when we may not necessarily like what we see. We got some good stuff, but we also pick up some bad stuff. Can I get two witnesses out there? And so the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because you, you that study this passage and know this story, realize that when Hagar, amen, was pregnant with Ishmael, come on, what did she do? She started just, just, just kind of flaunting it in Sarah's face. And Sarah got so angry, she started being mean to her and just real hateful. And so uh, Hagar ran away. Do y'all recall the story? We, we, we covered it a couple weeks back. So here we see uh, Hagar's son doing some of the very same thing. He mocking and making fun of Isaac, the promised seed. Let's keep reading, guys. Okay? The text says, well, let's read on. And, and so, so wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Now, we look at uh, what we're sharing here. It's critically important in your outline. Uh, you should, if you have that, uh, it's, on, it's on the church app. Uh, but we're talking about uh, how do we, amen, deal with confrontation? How do, we, how do we have conquering faith and confronting and overcoming conflict? Now, before I delve into that, I want to share some things with you because it's, it's critically important. One of the things that, that, that we need to realize is that all of us live in two worlds when it comes to relationships. Everybody say two worlds when it comes to relationships. And in one world... You know, we have friendly conversation in which we, you know, most of the time we avoid any, t any type of disagreement, right? Uh, and, uh, and so in, in, in that world we live, okay? You, you small talk, talk about sports, whatever, but you don't really get into anything deep. Even at work, you know, the first thing they tell you when you go to work, don't talk politics and don't talk what? Religion. Stay away from that because we want a clean work environment. So most of the time we, we live in that world where we, you know, we don't have very many disagreements because we don't really get deep. We don't talk about anything of substance. We, it's just basic stuff. Can I get a witness? And the, but, but in the other world, we have major conflict type conflict and conversations that tear everybody up and tear everything up from the floor up to the, to the head up, whatever. It, it tears us apart because a lot of times, in, we're talking about dysfunctional family. Many times we don't know how to do relationship God's way. We don't know how to confront things, amen, uh, the way God instructs us to confront. So in the first world, we have connection without truth. You connect with people, but you don't really get into deep truths. You, you don't really talk about things of substance. In the first world, we got connection without truth. And in the second world, we have truth without connection. In other words, you got true, but you're not really connecting uh, when you don't do relationship and conflict well. So if we're going to help, if we're going to be in a position where we can begin to deal with the dysfunction in our families, one of the things we have to do, guys, is get comfortable with confronting sin in our life, 
We got to get comfortable confronting uh, dysfunction and things that are not working properly. Then we got to be willing to to connect with somebody in in deep abiding gospel relationship and be able to talk about whatever we need to talk about. That's one of the things I'm I'm so thankful for. Uh, Guys like Jeff Harper and uh, Scott Patton and uh, others, uh, Tim Ross. Listen, this coming Wednesday night, you do not want to miss this real talk conversation I had with Pastor Tim Ross for Emerson City Church in Irving, Texas. He pastors a, a multicultural church, 60% black, maybe 40% other. Uh, and man, some rich gospel deep truths were shared on Wednesday. They were going to be shared on Wednesday night. So make sure you don't miss Wednesday at 7 o'clock. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit was all over that conversation. So you make sure you get there, okay? But, but, but again, we got to make sure that we get to a point to where we have truth, amen, abiding in how we relate to our fellow man. God did not design us to live in these two worlds having two types of relationships. In other words, remember what I say, in the first world, we have connection with our truth. In other words, you just do small talk. Most of the people that you, that you come in contact with, you don't really get deep with. You don't really talk to them about your family problems. You, as a matter of fact, most of us grew up, how many of y'all grew up and your mom and dad told you, boy, whatever goes on in this house, don't you tell nobody about it? Huh? And, and, and all of us know that there's some stuff going on in our houses that, that really wasn't godly. Even though the people in the house were going to church, there was major dysfunctionality from verbal abuse to physical abuse to just, just things not right, not working properly, and we were told, keep that to yourself. All right, how many of y'all went around blabbing what, on, what went on in your, in, your, in your house? And if your mama and them find out about it, they were going to tear your behind up, right? I mean, that was back in the days when st- people still got, I'm going to call it whoopings. Y'all know what a whooping is? <laughs> Caleb, do you know what a whooping is? You do? Okay. <laughs> Somebody still know what the Bible says. Uh, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the what? Rod of correction will do what? It'll drive foolishness out. But, but during those days, you didn't talk about stuff. And, and so what, what ended up happening is you had, you had fakeness in the church. And guys, that still happened in the year 2020. Most families don't deal with their dysfunctionality and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and, and, and begin to do a perfecting work because we keep it to ourselves. We don't want anybody to know that we're having trouble. So we end up suffering in silence. We won't, we won't come to counseling. If we do come to counseling, we're not really honest. You know, most, my, here, here's my experience. In 31 years of pastoring, here's what I've observed. It usually take about two or three times uh, when I'm counseling with somebody for the first time before they really get down to the real root problem. They're going to give me the surface stuff at first. All right? And then because they're they, they thinking, I, don't, I, can't tell, I can't tell Ray of all that because he's going to think something crazy about me. Not realizing that what God has blessed me to be able to do, and I I pray he blessed you to be able to do it, is to look at people with a biblical worldview. See, I can know your junk and not let your junk cause me to look at you differently. Let me say it again, because maybe maybe that went over here. I can know your junk, know your stuff, and, and it still not caused me to treat you differently because I know your stuff. Because your stuff is just different from some of that stuff, but all of us got some stuff. Amen. But 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 because because we live in a because we live in those two worlds where we have connection, but we don't have truth. You can come to church and be suffering, but won't feel like you can tell another brother, sister what I'm going through and what's happening in my life. Are y'all with me? Are 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 y'all tracking with me today? See, God, God wants us to to get to the point to where that, that we that we that we have truth with connection when we connect as a body believer, because we all come from Adam and Eve. We all of one blood. We all are brothers and sisters when you trace it back. Am I right about it? So, so, so God wants us to connect, but, but, but he wants us to live in, in the one world where he, where he lives and where truth and love coexist in their allies. In other words, the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. I want you to go with me right quick to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I know I'm jumping, but I got I to gotta throw this in. Guys, y'all may want to start my clock because I may preach for an hour and a half today if you don't, if you don't slow me down. Glory to God. Watch this, watch this. Go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse number 11. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Watch this. Now, I need y'all to pay close attention to what the Holy Scriptures say because it's the Word of God that produces the faith in our heart that causes us to trust God totally and completely. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by what? The Word of God. So I need Word, Lou, in order to be able to walk in faith. You, you want to say, it, without word, I can't have faith. And Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The person that comes to God, Kanisha must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Baby, how long did you stand before you get, got, in, got into veterinary school at LSU? How many years was it? Four years. Graduated four years ago, trusting and believing God that she would get into vet school. Somebody, I bet you probably got tired of folks asking you, well, you in yet? You think it's going to happen? Girl, you ain't gone to vet school yet. What you going to do? What if you don't get in? Baby, you in now. Come on, get a Lord a hand of praise. You in now. See, when you learn how to stand in faith and don't, after you have, the Bible says you have need of patience after you've done the will of God that you may receive the promise. So everything doesn't come just like that. But when you got faith and you trust God, he will bring it to pass. Can I get five witnesses out there? Can I get two witnesses? How about 15? How about 35 of you out there? But God is waiting on us. He's looking for believers who will trust him and take him at his word. The Bible says this, God, 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 God looks in, to and fro throughout the earth trying to find a man who he, who he can show himself strong toward. I want to know, are you that candidate that God can show himself strong toward? Look at what he says here. Now, guys, I got to move. I, this, is, this is something I, I need to share with you, and we're getting back to our text, but I need to share this. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the saints at Ephesus. Notice what he says. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Five, it's commonly referred to as the five-fold ministry gifts. Now, watch what he says. Their responsibility is to do what? Equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. The five-fold ministry gifts, including the pastoral, the pastor-teacher role, my responsibility is to equip you to do the work and to build up the church. Did y'all hear me? My responsibility is to equip you to do the work, along with me, obviously, but in some churches, they think it's the pastor's job to do all the witnesses, do all the evangelism, to do all the teaching. No, no, no. I need to equip the body, the shepherd, the, the, the sheep that God has placed me over to equip you to be able to do the work of ministry. Look at the next verse says, come on, let's go. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Next verse. Come on, we got to go. It says what? Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. You know, there's a lot of folks here, if, if, if something new comes along, they jump on it because they're not spiritually rooted and grounded in God's word. We won't be tossed and blown about every wind of new, doc, new teaching. We will be, not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Look at the next verse. Come on, let's go. 15 and 16. I'm going to stop at 16. Instead, we will, instead, See, we, we're talking about dysfunctionality in your family. We're talking about it. All of us got some stuff we got to work on. But the problem is that we live in this world where we, we, you know, we, we, we're not connected. Amen. Truth and connectivity is not in the same world in a lot of our lives. We're connected with people, but we're not really uh, close enough to them to speak gospel truth to them. But look what the text says. Instead, Paul is talking to the church. We will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the, ch the church. We go speak the truth in love. You know, most people don't like you to talk about their sin or their shortcomings. We get defensive. Come on now. Man, I, I, I'm in that boat too. I have to work to not be defensive. When you start talking about me, telling me what I got on ugly, and you know, first, you know, you, know, you say, Pastor, that don't even match. That's ugly. Uh, uh, okay. What you got on ugly too? You know how we do? We deflect and go back. But, 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 but if what I got on is, is ugly, 
And maybe it is ugly to you, but it ain't ugly to me. I threw it on, and, and I, I'm going to preach it today, so, so you just look at my ugly. <laughs> but, now, but now, guys, listen. We need people in our lives. We need people in our lives who will speak the truth in love. Who we're connected to in such a deep abiding gospel relationship that you won't run when you hear truth spoken in your life. Because all, see, we are our brother's keeper and we iron does sharpen iron. And so when you have those kind of relationships, you may get mad at it, but you need to come back the next Sunday. I told y'all before, when you, if you're a member of this church, at least 15% of the time you ought to be hot with me. And Pastor Adam up there talking about my sin. How, who told him what I did? Well, the Holy Spirit told me, because some of y'all think I'd be talking, I'm telling you, I've had people come up and tell me, yeah, I know you were talking about me. I had, they were not even nowhere on my mind. I didn't even know they were at church. But the Holy Spirit knows. He knows what you're dealing with. So as your pastor, guys, I'm gonna tell you, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And if you get mad at me, I'm okay with that. Just, just, just go, go pow for about five minutes and, and, and like your mom said, straight, straight your face up, boy. How many of y'all parents used to tell you that? Straight, you, you, <laughs> stop that crack. How many of y'all remember that? They'd be whipping you and telling you to stop crying. You're like, that, that don't even equate. You tear my behind up and want me to be quiet. But, but when I speak the truth in love, and it may hit you a little, hit you a little bit, okay, you're a little bit mad at me, but go pray about it. And, and the biggest thing is, do like the, the people in Berea. They search the scriptures to see if what the apostles told them was so. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to go and exegete the text. That's a big fancy word that, that if you go to seminary, you know what I mean, just go look it up. So you can have correct hermeneutics to be able to apply the Bible in your present day illustration in your present, present life. But we got to have people in our life who will speak truth to us. He says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Next verse says what? Come on, let's go. He makes, look, look at this. Watch this. Christ, Christ is the head of church. Who's the head of church? I'll back up. Let's look at it again. Who's the head of church? Watch this. It says, uh, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. The longer you say, the more all of us should look like Christ. We should not be stagnant, staying in the same baby state that we were when we first got saved. We were speaking truth and love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is what? The head of his body, the church. So Christ is the head of his body, the church. Not Doyle Adams. I'm just the under shepherd. I'm just the vessel. If I were to die tomorrow, God would raise somebody else up to pastor this church. Now, I'm, I'm not looking to go tomorrow. You understand me? But if I did, God has a ram in the bush. Can I get a witness? Next verse. Come on, I got I to go. It says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each, part, as, each, as, each part, as each part does its own special work, do you not realize, Brenda, Vincent, you got a special work? You got a gifting that all of us in this body need? K. Brian, you got a gifting that we need? Come on, are y'all with me? Al, your pilot, you got gifting that we need. He says, as each part does its own special work, what does it do? It helps the other parts, what? Grow. So now you sitting on your gift and we are not growing like we need to grow because you sitting there being immature. But they, ain't, they didn't call me to sing a song. I ain't getting back in the choir. We, we, we've been on the pandemic for three months and they ain't called me to say, I ain't getting back. When it's, you wait, wait till Maria come back and tell me all the quiet come. I'm not coming back. You know, I realize that the people had a kind of mindset. I, I, I mean, I don't know anybody here. Wank, wank. <laughs> but guys, we make ministry about us when it never should be about us. It should be all about him. Are you with me today? So it says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Watch this. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So we need your gift. We need you to grow. We need you to be maturing your faith such that you can plug in and we can benefit from your gift so that we can all grow. Amen? Now get back to Genesis right quick. I, I had to share that with you because our connections are best when they are truthful 
And our truth is best when we are connected. Amen. The Bible tells us, speak the truth in love. Confrontations and conversations work best when people both care for each other and tell the truth to each other. Quit lying to your fellow man. Tell the truth. Speak the truth in love. And we, 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 we don't do that often enough, amen? Good things happen when we do. People get along, resolve issues, and still maintain the connection they need when they speak the truth in love. Now, get back here to our text in Genesis 21. We have conflict that goes on here. But, but guys, listen. In, in, in con confronting and overcoming conflict, we see the nature of this conflict. We see what happened because, there's, guys, there's history here. There is history here that causes Sarah to go off. History here that causes Ishmael to be jealous of the fact that all of the attention now is being heaped on Isaac, the promised seed. That's history. And many times when you go into counseling or when you're dealing with a situation, people just tell you the fruit and they don't reveal the root. And if you don't deal with the root, guess what's going to happen? That fruit going to come back up. How many of y'all ever pull weed out your, out your flower garden or just pull, it, just pull the top of it up and then, you know, two or three, maybe three or four days of it, it comes right back up? Because if you don't deal with the root, guys, it's coming, it's coming up again. It is coming up again. And so God wants us to have these deep abiding gospel relationships so that we can speak the truth in love and deal with the root cause of some of our stuff that we're dealing with. So the nature of the conflict was Ishmael's sin. He, he mocked his little brother. He ridiculed him. He was mean to it. But the root, the, the, the issue was because it, it, it was a blended family and the, 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 the mama didn't get along with the outside lady and her son. And so we had all this stuff going on. Abraham. Now guys, let, let me tell you something. Their plan was never God's plan. Let me just say it right quick. The Bible the Bible, the Bible will reveal the warts of people who God used. So all of us got some warts. Just because Abraham did it, and just because Sarah suggested it, don't mean it was God's will. But God had chose them, and God is working on them through this process to get them to chapter 22. Guys, next week we're going to get to chapter 22, we're going to shout, because we're going to see Abraham being in the position where God says, now I know. I know where your heart is. God already knew, but he had to show Abraham where his heart was. Are y'all with me? So the nature of the conflict, it, we had Ishmael's sin. Then, then we had Sarah's sin. She overreacted. She, she, she was distrusting, and she, she was cruel. Look at verse number 10. Let's go to verse 10, okay? And then Abraham's response, we see he was distressed, and he was grieved, and he was perplexed by, 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 this, by this family stuff that's going on. When you got blended families, you got turmoil if you don't deal with it the right way. Look at what he said. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bond, the same woman she told her husband to go sleep with. The same woman who got distressed because the pregnant woman who he, she told her husband to sleep with now was making fun of her and flaunting it in front of her. Look at me, I'm pregnant. You can't get pregnant. Look at my big old belly. Look at the baby kicking. Ooh, we Sarah, 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 Sarah. Ooh, we Sarah. I got a baby in the belly. I don't know what she was saying, but what else? I don't know. I don't, I, maybe she said that. I don't know. You you don't know, so you can't 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 tell. I'm, I'm teaching false doctrine. I don't know what she said. You don't either. <laughs> but she had to do something, cause Sarah got so incensed and mad. She she became so cruel to her that Hagar ran off. She came back. God protected her while she's out there. Let me tell you something. See, a lot of us in our lives, you know, I told you before, when you birthed your Ishmael, you got to change his diapers. That flew over somebody's head right there. When you birthed an Ishmael, when you do something in the flesh, God will forgive you for what you did in the flesh, but guess what? There's consequences to your fleshly decision. And what we want to do, we want to, we, want to, we want to get in the flesh, do our deal in the flesh, and then God forgive me, God forgive me, and Lord, don't let no consequences come, Lord, because you really forgave me, you, 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 you're going to keep our relationship together. No, see, sometimes we do stuff in the flesh, God forgives us, but there's consequences. If I go down there right now and rob Brooks, God will forgive me for robbing Brooks, but guess what's going to happen? The preacher going to jail. 
I'll be forgiven during my five years up, up the street. And my, I own member, Keisha uh, Evans, <laughs> will be the warden over her pastor for robbing Brookshire's. God forgave me, but there's consequences to the Ishmael that I birthed. And some of y'all right now got some Ishmaels that you birthed, and now you don't want to deal, you don't want to change the diaper. You want, you want them to go away, but you got to deal with it. Are y'all, are y'all getting my drift here? So wherefore she said to Nabrab, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman should not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Get him out. Watch, watch, what, she, watch what she says. Now, come on, let's go. Says, and the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. See, guys, here's the thing about it. He loved this boy. He didn't hate Ishmael, but this thing was very grievous. It, it upset Abraham because he was the father of Ishmael before he was Isaac. But Isaac was the promised seed, and God is still working. God got to do something through that promised seed. He's going to take care of Ishmael and Hagar, but he's got to do something through that promised seed. And he's not going to let anything mess that up. See, sometimes in your own life, guys, you may not understand and see God's hand moving and working, but when God's got a plan, he'll, he'll, take, you, he'll take you through a wilderness experience. He'll take you through whatever he's got to take you through to build your faith to work his plan in your life. Faith is so important to God that he'll take you through some stuff to build it up in you because he knows he can't use you without faith. I just told you, without faith is what? Impossible to please God. The person that comes to God has to believe that God is and that he's a reward of him that is diligently seeking. Now, if you don't have any faith, because if you don't spend any time in the Word, you can't have faith. Because faith coming by, and hearing by what? Meditating, regurgitating it, contemplating it, chewing on it, putting it before your eyes and saying, you know what, God, I, 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 I don't see it, God. I don't feel it. God, I don't even see how you're going to work it out, but I'm going to trust that you're going to work it out. Even though I can't trace you, I'm still going to trust you. Even though I can't see your hand moving, I can't see what you're doing, God, but I know you're a God who does not, who do not lie, and God, I know you're a God who fulfills your promises. And Lord, I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to let my feelings catch up with my obedience. That's the kind of person that God is looking for. And guys, in this time that we're living in, this half-baked, nilly-willy, you know, Sometimes up, sometimes down, level to the ground, Christianity. God said, it's time out for that. You got to grow. We got to learn to be disciples. Okay, I got to move. I got to move. So, so Abraham responds to greeting. But the answer, here's the answer to the conflict. God. Any conflict you got, God is the answer. Are y'all with me? God is the answer. Now, first of all, we got... God's word. The answer to the conflict is God's word. Whenever, whenever you're in conflict with another believer in Christ Jesus, your responsibility is to get word on the issue. Get word on the disagreement. And let the word be the, the preeminent voice in how you settle the issue. Let the word be the preeminent voice in what's right in the situation. God's word. Look at verse 12 with me right quick. Come on, let's go. Verse 12 says, and God, God, and who said? And God said unto Abraham, let, let, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of this lad and because of thy, the bond woman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now Sarah was, you know, Sarah was, was upset, distraught, strong, and, and, and really this was kind of mean. And in my mind, it was, it was like, you know, okay. I don't know what all she was going through, but God, God still had to work a purpose in them because he is the promised seed. The text says, so, so we see here God's word. God gave, God gave Abraham his word. God spoke to Abraham, encouraging him and relieving the distress and the grief that he was under. The second thing is we see that God's purpose is fulfilled. God reminded Abraham of his great purpose. Isaac was to be the promised seed, not Ishmael. The son who was, Isaac was the, was the son was gonna, he, he was going to give to rise up and be the chosen lineage through which the Savior would be birthed through. So God still had to protect that. So God's purpose was still on display here as he tells him to send Haggai and Ishmael away. But he's going to protect them, guys. He's going to protect them because, see, God knew that when Sarah and Abraham did that, that was not his plan, but God's still going to protect. God always has a heart for the widows and the orphans. God always has a heart for the poor. 
Check your Bible out. God always is going to be where people are hurting. So God's purpose, amen, was, was on display in God's assurance. God assured Abraham that the conflict would be resolved. Ishmael would be looked after and richly blessed by God. Look at verse number 13 with me right quick, okay? He would grow into a great nation of people. And the guys, let me tell you something. Uh, the descendants of Ishmael and Isaac are plentiful across this globe. The descendants of Ishmael are those Arabic nations. And they've been at war with the sons of Isaac all these years. This is, this, this is do y'all still know that, that, that a lot of, there are, there are Arab nations that are part of their creed and their constitution is to wipe Jerusalem off the map, to wipe Israel off the map. And they're surrounded, Israel, this little tiny nation is surrounded by all these, all these descendants of Ishmael. It's a family feud. But guess what, guys? God, when he is your protector and your provider, I don't care how many enemies come against you, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. When you belong to God and you, you are in covenant relationship with him, he'll keep, you, he'll keep your enemies at bay. As a matter of fact, he'll make your enemies your footstool. Israel, still, God's still holding their hand up. God is still protecting them even when others want to destroy them. The descendants of Isaac and Ishmael still at war today, guys. I mean, this, this thing started way back here in the scripture, but it's still going on today. And also the son of the bond woman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. He was Abraham's seed, even though it was conceived in the flesh, but God said, I'm going to take care of him. All right? So the results of the conflict, you had broken hearts, you have separation, you got divorce. Because again, when, when, he, when he connected with this woman, it was, it was like in that culture, he was, he, it, was, it was polygamy. Guys, no, no man can have more than one wife. That ain't God's will. Y'all with me? Now, here we see God using a man who did something that was outside his will. How many of y'all look in the Bible and say, ooh, ain't that a shame? Don't you do that because I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. And we've done some things outside the will of God and God's still using us. Oh, don't y'all look at me like that. Yeah, I know you're saved. I know uh, you study your Bible. I know you're in, in church every week. But I promise you, if I were to pull back the curtain of your life and we could play your life on a screen, y'all be doing this right here. Excuse me, but Pastor. I see y'all, and I, but I won't see you again. Because if we knew everything that you did, if we knew every thought that came to your mind, how many of y'all be embarrassed? If we knew every thought, I'm talking about every thought. I'm talking about every thought. The ones you had to bring into captivity because they did not line up with God's word. That one, yeah, that one. The one you thought about, yeah, last week. The one you thought about when you were 25. Or the one that you, not only did you think about it, but you committed it. All I got to do is go back to some of y'all's college years, and you're like, oh, don't, don't, don't go there, Pastor. Don't go there. Somebody said, please don't. <laughs> but guys, thank God that we have a forgiving God. And when we set our heart towards him, he'll forgive us. The Bible says uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He'll do what cleanses from all unrighteousness. All right, so, so, so we get victory in this conflict. Let's go back. Uh, let's, let's, let's move forward here, okay? The fourth thing is the victory over the conflict we see here in the 16th verse. Go to the 16th verse. We're going to skip ahead here. The text says this, and she went and sat her down over against him a good way off. This is, Ish, this is uh, Hagar and Ishmael, as it were, a bow shot. For she said, this is Hagar said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. Sarah kicked her out. But again, we're going to see some victory over the conflict in here. Watch it. The text says, next verse. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Next verse says, Well, he was Abraham's son, guys. Even though he was the outside child, so to speak, he still belonged to Abraham. 
And let me say this, let me, let me say, for whoever this is for, let me say this right quick. If you are, if you are a wife and, and, and it's a blended family situation and your husband has children, don't keep your husband from being involved in his children's life because of your insecurities. Every child needs their father. Even if it didn't work out with you and him, don't be using the child and putting them in the middle of that. And vice versa. Husband, don't, don't you do the very same thing. It, it, it's, it's such a dastardly thing when grown tail folk, let me put it that way, grown tail folk, <laughs> will put children in the middle of your junk, in the, in the middle of your dysfunctionality because you were dysfunctional, didn't know how to do marriage, didn't know how to do a relationship. Now you go put the, use the children to punish the other person. That's, that's a shame. And you in the church praying every Sunday. Everybody say dysfunction. Say it's messed up. It's not right. Let's get it right. So that, that's, I don't know who that's for, but quit using, that's, that's, listen, God just told me that's a prophetic word because somebody's been having some trouble with, 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 with those kind of relationships. You stop it. You need to be an example of what it means to allow God to be the head of your life. And that child had nothing to do with getting here. That child had, they didn't, they didn't shoot. You the one went, did it. And now that it didn't work out, you're trying to punish the other person by using the child as a, a pawn between, don't do that. You love those children. And you shouldn't have married him if you didn't, you didn't, if you didn't want to be a part of the seed that was of him. I, here's what I do when I counsel uh, couples, uh, who are going to get married and it's going to be a blended family. I said, first and foremost, first of all, first of all, you got to love God and you got to decide you're going to do this God's way and don't come in here talking about his children and my children. That lets me know right now you have the wrong concept. Because when the two become one flesh, everything else becomes one flesh. And if you don't do that, you're not doing it right. That includes your money. That includes your money. All y'all live streaming, that includes your money. <laughs> your time, your love. You pour into that child just like if you're, if you can't accept it, the children don't marry the person. Can I get two amens out there? You say, sanctify, say you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're acting like that? Come on. Say, come on, man. Say, come on, man. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that, okay? All right, so, so we, we had this conflict. I told you, it's a little messy in this Abrahamic family, but you know what? God is still God, and God still uses messed up people to get his will done. I got to finish, y'all. Watch this, watch this. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. This is God talking about the outside child. And he's done. God has been faithful. Now, guys, that's the conquering faith, confronting and overcoming conflict. Let me give you seven things that, that's, that's important. I'm just jot these down, guys. And this is just nugget. We'll pick up neighborly faith next week. And it's going to be two weeks before we finish this, guys. I told y'all next week, but I knew I wasn't going to get. I'm pacing myself. Okay. We all stick with me? Because how many of you know we got some messed up families? We got some dysfunction. And, and when we as believers don't know how to handle that dysfunction, and we, we become a poor witness and a poor testimony to the world, okay? Let me get, let me get this is not on your notes, but just, just jot these down. Some, so, so some seven benefits of confronting wrongdoing, confronting sin, confronting or speaking the truth in love. Here's some seven benefits of confrontation. Number one, it preserves love. Everybody say preserve love. Confrontation preserves love in a relationship. I know you said, Pastor, what are you talking about? See, most of us think that don't, don't even make sense. Well, we think that if, if I confront someone, here's what we think. If I confront someone, they're going to either get mad or leave the relationship altogether. And, and, and that does happen on occasion when we got immature people, but confrontation was not designed to make someone angry or chase them away. In fact, it was designed to do the opposite. The, the Latin, listen to this, the Latin term for confrontation means to turn your face toward, 
to look at frontally, to turn your face toward and to look at somebody face to face. It just indicates that you are turning toward the relationship and the person. In confrontation, people simply face the relationship and deal with an aspect of the connection that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be addressed. Listen to me carefully. The intent of confrontation is to make the relationship better, to deepen the intimacy, guys, amen, and to create more love and respect between two people. So when you have to deal with a problem, guys, it's not designed to injure you or to hurt you. It's designed to preserve the love in your relationship. But most people don't do it very well. Most of y'all sitting here right now, and the person you're married to or the person who's your mama, your dad, or your child, there is something that you probably need to talk to them about, but you're afraid to talk to them about it. You're afraid of the blowback, or you're afraid of how they're going to feel, and whether or not they're going to like you anymore, whether or not they're going to invite you over for Sunday dinner anymore, or whether or not it's going to be no sex because you addressed my issue. That goes for husband and wife. <clears throat> Let me say it again. There ain't gonna be no intimacy because you dealt with my stuff. You dealt, you, you addressed my issue, so I'm gonna keep myself from you. When Paul, Paul, Paul in 1 Corinthians the seventh chapter, I know it get a little quiet and you say we got children in the past. You need to be gentle. I am being gentle. Your children know more than what you think they know. And so you better start teaching them because the, those little rascals on the internet, they don't saw some stuff that you, you don't even know. They, they, they saw it, clicked off and saw you coming. They kicked back on when you left. Do you not know the average age when a child, a young man is exposed to pornography is eight years old? Did you hear me? Eight years old our children are being exposed to pornographic images online. And you think they're in there doing homework. So in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, don't defraud one another, except to be with consent for a time that you may give yourself over to fasting and praying. See, why you can't fast and pray all year? Oh, it ain't just the wife. Husband, you can't fast and pray all year and deny your spouse intimacy. Wow, it got eerily quiet in here. But I'm speaking Bible. If you don't believe me, go to 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and read it for yourself. I don't have time to turn there, but Paul dealt with that issue very clearly in, as he dealt with the church of Corinth, because the church of Corinth had a problem with sexual immorality. And I got news for you today. The church today has a problem with sexual immorality but nobody wants to talk about it. Shh. That's why divorce is running rampant. This is high in the church as it is out in the world because we won't confront stuff. So it preserves, number one, it, confrontation preserves love in the relationships. Like, kind of like tending the garden. If, 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 that, if, if your, your fruit and stuff are going to grow out, you got a garden, you got to go out there and pull some weeds. You got you to work that thing. You can't just plant seeds. Oh, come okay, on, wait the four months and see what come up. Could be a bunch of weeds. You got to work it. You got to work your relationships. Number two, it, 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 when, you, when you confront, it resolves alienation. Healthy confrontation brings disconnected people back together. It resolves alienation. You ever felt alienated in your family? Talk to me. I, I, I need, you, you don't have to raise your hand, but just not to, you ever felt like your family just wasn't connecting with you or maybe you were on the house with your family or your husband, your wife, or, or the, your family at work? Or listen, look, listen, listen, we all come from one seed. We all are part of the same family. Have you ever felt alienated from your black brother, your white brother? Oh, tell, come on, talk to me. Our country has a history of that, doesn't it? And that's why we're trying to deal with it. See, when you feel alienated, when you learn how to confront stuff, when you stop pretending like it's not there, then you can bring disconnected people back together. So it resolves alienation. That's what conflict does. Man, I got so much to say on this. I, I, I hate to even start giving y'all that. Can y'all let me come back next week on that? I'm going to come back next week on that, okay? And, and I, I know I'm messing up my notes, but, and I'll put this in your notes next week, okay? But I, I want to I talk about that because we have to learn how to confront the right way. 
You don't confront cussing and fussing and being belligerent. That's not God's way. But you do need to speak the truth in love to deal with the dysfunctionality that's a part of your family relationship. Jesus gave his life for each one of us out on Calvary to help us get to where he desires and he designed us to be. We all are seed of Adam and Eve, and he wants to help us get to our proper place in him. He gave his life for us out on Calvary, crucified, hung, bled, and died, buried in a borrowed tomb, resurrected the third day morning with all power and heaven through his hand. That very same Jesus says, I'm going to delegate my authority to you. I want you to be my ambassador. You're living here on earth, but your, he your home is in heaven. And so since you are an ambassador for Christ, God says, use your life to honor me, to honor your, your home state, which is heaven. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. And we praise you for this divine opportunity. Oh God, you're so wonderful and you are so kind. Lord, we just, we, we, we love you and we praise you and we lift you up. Lord, I, I know that you're, you're moving. You're moving in this world today. Father God, you have everything under control. Man may not know what's happening. Man maybe trying to figure out what's going on with this pandemic, but it never caught you by surprise. And Father God, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that you are using it to speak to your church. You're trying to get us to do a reset, to get back, in some cases, get to where we, we never were in the first place, becoming discipled ones, ones who you, who you can use to advance kingdom principles. We love you, God, and praise you. Thank you for your word today. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus. I do pray, God, and thank you. Is every head is still bowed. Now, and guys, I want y'all to hear me carefully. And those who are listening by way of live stream, the one thing that God desires from each one of us is a covenant relationship. He wants to connect with us. I don't care how, how foul or dirty or nasty you've been, God still desires to connect with you. He gave his only begotten son so that you and I could enter into the presence of a holy God. He loved us enough, guys, that even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, he sent his very best to die on the cross for us. So now, if you want to have that personal relationship with God, I want to give you that opportunity today. Listen, it's very simple. Number one, all you got to do is realize that you need salvation first and foremost. If you want to be saved, you know you need to be saved. That's the first step. And the second step is you got to believe that, the, that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He, he died a sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary so that you and I could have the right to interface with a holy God. And then third, the third thing is simple. Jesus said, if you would invite me to come in, he stand at the door and knock. If any man hears his voice and open up, he'll come in and make his abode there. So if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, then he'll, he will come in and you shall be saved. Now that's the beginning of the journey, guys. And here's how you can tell if you're really on the journey or not. When there's a life change, when you, are, when, when, when you sin and it bothers you, if you can sin and it doesn't bother you, something's not right. But if you really meant that, then get plugged in to a Bible-believing church. So if you want to be saved today, just lift your hand where you are. If you're out there listening to it via live stream, you can just ask, say, Jesus Christ, I want you to come into my heart to save me. I realize I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I don't know all there is to know, but I'm going to trust in your sacrificial death and come into my heart to save me. And if you did that, we want to hear from you. Give us a call, uh, email us, and let us know that you made a decision for Christ. Amen. And if you're here in this place, sitting in the sanctuary, and you want to be saved, you can stand on your feet. We'll pray for you right where you are. But beyond that, guys, if, you are, if you're already saved, but you have trouble dealing with conflict or confronting stuff that needs to be confronted, dysfunctionality in your relationships, whether it's a work relationship, 
a family of origin relationship, a church family relationship, or a, a humankind relationship, black and white. If you have trouble dealing with that, stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. I want, I want, I want to pray for God. I know some of y'all are non-confrontational people. You don't, you're not going around looking for an argument, but there's some times when you got to address an issue and you may be a little bit fearful or maybe a fearful of the outcome. Stand to your feet. Let me pray for you. I know I'm right about it. Come on, if, 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 if there's some things that you need to confront, but maybe you haven't just got the courage or the strength, I don't know what scripture to stand on to confront that certain issue. I'm gonna pray for God give you the strength to do so. Hallelujah. Is there one? I see you, I see you. Glory to God. Come on, let's pray, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I lift up those who are standing here in the auditorium and those who may be in their homes or wherever they may be watching us via live stream. God, you know their heart. You know, God, what their desire is. And Father God, I thank you right now, God, that we are willing to stand and say, Lord, we need your help and we need you to do it for us. Right now, in Jesus' name, God, I pray for strength. I pray for spiritual boldness that it will engulf and overtake everyone who's standing right now. God, give them the proper words, give them the proper timing to deal with that dysfunction that's in that relationship that they're involved in. Whether it's church, family, uh, whatever it may be. Teammate, mother, daughter, father, son, husband, wife. God, help each one of us to deal appropriately with those dysfunctional uh, mechanisms that are, that are operating in our life right now. Lord, I thank you that we can come to you and receive by grace and by faith your call and your power. Teach us, help us to get there, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we receive it. All God should have said amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Hallelujah. Listen, we thank God for you. I want to encourage you. Listen, there's a lot of things that uh, many of us need to address. And when I, the, the term confront, you remember I said it's to turn your face toward that relationship and, and look them eyeball to eyeball and say, here is something that we got to deal with. It's not allowing us to be in connection and the truth is not being spread in our relationship. Amen. And we do that, we're going to get there, okay? God bless you, man.